the I Ching says never confront evil directly and never name it directly because it finds weapons to, to defend itself. We are not an army. This is what Frederick didn't understand. He was a king, but he was not an army when it came to the White Mountain. We are not an army, so our strategy must be stealth. It's an alchemical strategy. And what do I mean by stealth? I mean uh, the house of constipated reason must be infiltrated by art, by dreamers, by vision. And what is new is that there are massive technologies available to us not available in the 60s. They were not designed for us. They were not intended for us. It was never ever thought that such power should flow into the hands of freaks such as ourselves. Nevertheless, through the perverse nature of the unfolding of the world, uh, we have such tools. And I'm referring, uh, as you probably anticipate, uh, to the World Wide Web and the internet. No gay kid in Montana, no Chinese scholar in Botswana, no person anywhere with a specialized interest or predilection now need feel alone. There is no aloneness. You can find your people you know, one of the things Tim Leary said in the 60s that I always remembered, but I never heard anybody talk about or ever really heard him quote. It was a great rallying cry. It was much better than turn on, tune in, drop out. And it was this. It was find the others. Find the others. And then you will know what to do. Well, now you can find the others. You don't have to stick a flower in your hair and go to San Francisco. Uh, you just uh, go to the web. Find the others. We all need to create affinity groups, which are subsets of the much larger community that we're part of. And then, using this technology, which was designed to keep track of us, to pick our pockets and to sell us junk we don't want, use this technology to produce art, massive amounts of subversive art. And all art is subversive. I'm not calling for an ideological agenda. All truth which springs from the individual is subversive because, and this is a, a theme of mine that I'm getting more and more into the longer I live, culture is not your friend. This is an odd message for the late 90s because we're all being told, you know, you, you, you knew you were Jewish, but you forgot your Sicilian grandmother. You have to honor all of your family. You Romanian, bring it forward, the dances of this, that, and the other. I hate all of this stuff. I'm Irish. It's a weird thing to be. It's a haunted, uh, twisted people as a people. All peoples, meaning tribes, have horrible stories to tell about who they did under and who they screwed over. And when you're asked to identify with your culture, you're asked to take this on. I, I, I reject it. Uh, my brother, years ago, he invented this term. He, he called it extra environmental. He said, this is what we want to be. We don't want to be Americans or Germans or English. We want to be extra environmentalists. Always feel wherever you go that you are a stranger, the outsider, the one looking in. This is the viewpoint that makes all places the same to you. There's a wonderful English uh, poet and writer, Rudyard Kipling, and he wrote a children's short story called The Cat Who Walked By Himself. And it's a story of how the dog came to the cave of man and would lay at the man's feet. 
but the cat would never come. And when the woman asked the cat why it would never come, it said, I am the cat who walks by himself, and all places are alike to me. And I think transcending our cultures is going to be extraordinarily necessary for our survival. I don't think we can carry our cultures through the keyhole of, of the stretch of the next millennium. Well, how do you shed your culture? How do you transcend your culture? By digging into your soul with the tools that have been given you to make art. This is how cultures are transformed, by art which flows up and actually submerges the previous cultural forms. I mean, uh, uh, the Baroque gave way to later periods simply out of exhaustion. But notice, a style can exhaust itself and still continue as mannerism did out of the Renaissance, for example. And when these exhausted styles are allowed to continue, they become toxic. They become moribund. It's like keeping a corpse around the house. Uh, there is an obligation to overthrow that, to produce the new, to produce the novel. And by the novel, I don't mean the literary form, I mean all things new. And then uh, it is not the function of the artist to be the critic. Uh, the, the winnowing out, the deciding what is good from what is bad comes later. And that's a community process. The community decides what is good and bad art, but the individual should pour this forth. I mean, this is what you are. You are some kind of a mystery suspended between two eternities. And in that moment, when a mind looks out at a world and asks the question, what is it? In that moment, uh, art can be created. And it is the only form of immortality that I have any certainty of. And it's available to everyone. Uh, it, and at the present moment, I make no distinction between art and techni. I mean, to my mind, these things are the same thing. A great turning point is in the offing. The world is changing. It's changed before, but not for a long time in our lives. Not since before our lives, but now it's changing, and there are many, many possibilities. Uh, the English biologist Dawkins invented the word meme. Do you all know what a meme is? It's the smallest unit of an idea. It's like a, what a gene is to biology, a meme is to ideology. And so our, our task is to create memes Madonna is a meme, Catholicism is a meme, Marxism is a meme, yellow sweaters are a meme. Create memes. Rainbow-colored dreadlocks are a meme. Launch your meme boldly and see if it will replicate, just like genes replicate, and infect and move into the organism of society. and believing as I do that society operates on a kind of biological economy, then I believe these memes are the key to societal evolution. But unless the memes are released to play the game, there's no progress. So I think the obligation on people such as ourselves, and I assume probably without exception, everybody in this room falls into the upper 5% of the Earth's population in terms of wealth, education, and freedom. Even if you're some poor, pierced metalhead from the dark side of Mannheim, <laughs> you have a better 
situation than most people on this uh, planet, a better chance at actually reaching out toward the machinery that shapes reality and having an impact. Well, so then the question becomes, or, or for some people is, well, but I, I have nothing to say, or I have nothing to paint, or I have nothing to communicate. Well, clearly you're not taking enough drugs then. Uh, that excuse simply will not be tolerated. Uh, and and it, if someone finds that decadent or flippant or destructive, then they don't understand what these psychedelic substances are. They open the doorway to creativity. They cleanse uh, uh, the doors of perception. And then, as Blake said, reality is perceived as it truly is, as infinite. Part of what is wrong with our society, and hence with ourselves, is that we consume images. We don't produce them. We need to produce, not consume media. The media is a huge issue. You can't escape it. So what are you going to do about it? The only solution is to drive it, to take charge. Otherwise, you will be poisoned by it. And, and as more and more people are waking up to this, essentially we are seeing, I think, a, a huge artistic revolution, a revolution in values that reaches into science, that reaches into politics, that reaches into every aspect of life, but that is coming from the imagination, thoroughly stimulated and activated uh, by the discovery of all these natural and synthetic substances uh, which perturb the mind. And I'm not denying that a certain amount of social chaos goes along with this. But on the other hand, I can point to pretty psychedelically pure centuries, like the 13th in Europe, and there was still plenty of social chaos going on. I don't think psych you can lay social chaos at the feet of psychedelics. Uh, I think social chaos is an inimical part of the system. What psychedelics do is they give a direction to that chaos, a dimension of vertical ascent, because inevitably out of the psychedelic situation emerges not despair, not self-indulgence, but wild-eyed idealism. That's the inevitable pro uh, product of any psychedelically driven social process, how well that idealistic idea then brokers its way to the throne, if it does, is, a, is another issue. I don't know if I've hit this technological thing hard enough. I, I hope that you all uh, avail yourselves of the power of the internet. In years past, in speaking to audiences in America, it was maddening to me to find that the environmentalists, the feminists, the gays, the psychedelic people, and I'm not sure if I got everybody, and the space people, the colonization people, none of these people had anything to say to each other. They didn't seem to realize that their marginality united them far more than any difference they might perceive in their positions. And they didn't seem to realize that their political disempowerment was a product of their inability to make common cause with uh, people similarly motivated or similarly motivated toward social change. So uh, it's, it's very important to build an inclusive community and a community that has a sense of direction. And I think the internet empowers this far more than any other tool that has been handed to us except psychedelics. And if you take psychedelics and the internet, and music, 
and put all of that together, you have the basis for a new community that is wider and deeper than you know. The people who are building the new machines, who are designing the new circuitry, who are writing the new code, are all freaks. Uh, I mean, they work for capitalist dogs, of course, because we all do. But, uh, but uh, the, the creative thrust of these technologies is being driven by people just like you and me. And I think this is all tremendously positive. So um, where am I in all of this? Well, I'm, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Uh, and then finally, I guess, and I'll just close on this, the alchemical return. Uh, all culture is some kind of myth. All cultural stories then have a psychic dynamic to them which is not suspected by the civilization as it lives, these myths. It has to be seen from outside. And there is a consistent myth in, in let's call it just Western civilization without being too precise, a consistent myth. Uh, in the early Jews, you get it as the idea that God will enter history. With Christianity, you get it with the idea that man and God can be consubstantial. Uh, again, in Islam, the insistence that God will enter history. And then modern science, strangely enough, dumps all of this theology, but maintains the idea that man can become as a god. In other words, the myth that is consistent throughout the entire Western experience is the myth of some kind of defining progressive experience. Well, now we have the power to realize this myth in some kind of uh, uh, for want of a better word, an alchemical utopia. And I think it's very interesting that at this very high-tech moment in our adventure, the plants return, the humblest of all biology. The plants return and almost stand before us as a, a beacon and a promise. Have you noticed that plants do all their business with dirt and air? This is something we only wish we could do. Build an industrial society based on nothing more than the ambient uh, dirt and the air flowing past. Uh, building sugars and carbohydrates out of gaseous oxygen. I mean, this is uh, quite a trick. The plants stand both in, in the psychedelic sense, but then in the larger sense of the vegetable kingdom, they stand for absolute Tao. They stand for the correct way for life to relate to its environment, effortlessly recycling vegetatively propagating when necessary, sexually propagating when necessary, uh, immune to pain, patient to the tune of centuries, uh, always building up structure, always maintaining a leavening effect upon the land. All of these qualities of caregiving and uh, uh, well, notice, for example, that all the processes of biology occur below the boiling point of water. If we could build societies that did that, we work at the, in the range of hundreds of degrees, thousands of degrees, fusing metals and creating toxicity. So I think the, the psychedelic plant revolution 
which is leading toward the nanotechnological revolution. In other words, the imitating of nature at the atomic level in building of machines and, and the, the management of processes. What all of this is leading <coughs> toward is a rarefaction, a good alchemical word, a rarefaction of the human uh, imprint on this planet, a spiritualization of humanity and a new order of mind, part machine, part human. Uh, notice that the internet and the computers that it serves are actually made of the materials of the earth. They're largely metals, silicon, glass, copper, gold, silver. These are the products of demonic artifice. These are the things which the alchemists dreamed of. They transform space and time. They allow us to speak at a distance. They allow us to wander through libraries thousands of miles distant. No fact is too obscure, no person so hidden that you can't reach them. Uh, it is, in a way, the perfection of the magical ideal that was developed and uh, unfortunately prematurely launched by Frederick the Elector and his wife here nearby at Heidelberg. And so I'm involved, as I said, in a process of bringing this story to many people who haven't heard it. It's a great story. It's a, it's a great myth that the underground community should uh, make its own. And, you know, I used it this evening just as the scaffold for this talk, but I tried to hit the things that are important to me, which are psychedelics, recovery of archaic lifestyles, use of media to subvert existing paradigms, empowerment of the individual through dissolving the ego through psychedelics, and, uh, oh, I don't know, whatever else. So thank you for your patience and indulgence. And if you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer.